Good evening. Could you turn with me in God's Word to Mark chapter 2? We'll be reading from verse 1. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home, and many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door, and he was preaching the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men, and when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had made an opening, let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there, questioned their hearts. Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose immediately and picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Let's pray. Oh, great God in heaven, as we come before you, we do marvel at what these truths we have been singing, this wonderful exchange, your robes for ours, our sins forgiven. And as we look at this passage that highlights this very point, Lord, we do ask that you would give us an acute awareness of of the glories that that entails. We pray that you would use truth like this to shape and fashion us to be more like Christ in every way possible. Amen. I don't know how many of you remember those old glow mail infomercials. If you grew up in the 90s like I did, then you're probably very familiar with them. Um, For the younger people um, who aren't familiar with them, Um, Back when I was growing up, let's say the olden days, there was no such thing as streaming services like Netflix or YouTube. You could only watch the show that was playing on the TV at that point in time. And if you were sick and staying home from school, then you only had two options. You could watch old soapy reruns or infomercials. And I obviously always chose infomercials. These were adverts where they sold you like all these kind of crazy products. Um, You know, the latest glow mail products. And it wasn't just a salesperson telling you, here's this product, it's the best, buy it. No, no, these were actually somewhat entertaining. You see, they would demonstrate with these crazy things how their products work. You know, a vacuum cleaner that can pick up a bowling ball or car polish that you can set on fire and the car doesn't get damaged or a blow-up mattress that you can drive over with a bulldozer. Those kinds of things. And it was very effective. I, I know it was effective because as a little kid, I had no car, but I needed that polish that was fireproof. You know, I didn't have a bowling ball or I had never vacuumed a day in my life but I wanted one that could pick up a bowling ball. But, but lucky as I grew older, I kind of saw through the, the gimmickiness of all of this. But I believe that these ads were so successful because of these like, outlandish demonstrations. Because in there, people could see that the thing did what the salesperson said it did. These salesmen, from that perspective, weren't just talking, but they were showing what their products could do. And our passage today is is littered with similar demonstrations, though I would say that it's not a sales gimmick or not some kind of camera trick. But, But 
there's demonstrations here that show us unseen realities that, that can't really be proven or validated outside of the demonstrations. You see, in Mark now, we, we move into a new section. From chapter 2, verse 1 to early, that's about 3, verse 6, there's five different accounts of Jesus clashing with the religious leaders and the people of his day um, who were not happy with the things that he said and did. Because what he said and did some shocking things in the passages to come, uh, given the context of their day. And in, in today's passage, we, we also see some, some bold claims to authority, and, and we see some, some crazy things happening here. You people digging through somebody else's roof. But these weren't just mere claims that were made. They, they're words that are backed up with demonstrations of power. And then they show exactly who Jesus is. They show exactly what is going on there. It reveals these unseen realities to us. And so as we look at this text today, I would like to look at it through what I believe is three things that is clearly demonstrated to us in this account. Firstly, a demonstration of faith in the crowd. Then a demonstration of, a man, of man's need before God. And finally, the demonstration of the authority of the Son of Man. So, so we'll start with our first point, a demonstration of faith in the crowd. At the end of chapter 1, we saw that Jesus had embarked and started traveling all around Galilee, and um, he had preached in various places. And then in today's passage, it begins with him returning home to Capernaum. And, and when it says they saw he was at home, they don't mean home in a general sense, like he's just back in Capernaum. They, they do mean an actual place that would have been considered his home. Um, the Greek word there, says, it actually translates, they saw he was at the house, which was a common way of talking about a person's house. And this home was probably Peter's home, but, but we don't know for certain. And I think that going down that trail to try and prove or disprove it is, is actually just a waste of time. Because wherever it was, people soon caught wind that he was back. And then they started to come again, and they filled his house. And he, he was very famous. And, and as we learned in Andrew's sermon last week, he had, his fame had grown, and he couldn't go anywhere without being recognized. But this fame wasn't actually a good thing. It actually proved to be a hindrance to his ministry. And, and we see in the text right now his fame becoming a problem yet again. Because in no time a crowd gathers into the house. It fills this house. That the people cannot come and go anymore. And, and then he starts preaching to them. And at this point we may be thinking, but wait a minute, this big crowd around him and he's preaching to them, isn't this a wonderful opportunity to share the gospel? And that, that is true. And Jesus does take every opportunity like this to preach the gospel to the crowd. He does this because of his compassion for them. Because he sees how they need the gospel. So whenever a crowd is gathered, we, we'll notice that Jesus preaches to them. He preaches the good news to them. But it doesn't mean that these big crowds are a positive thing. In, in fact, if we look at, at the word for crowd in Mark, it's mentioned over 40 times. The crowd plays a big role in, in the book of Mark. But never once, never once in Mark do they respond in repentance and faith, as the gospel tells us that we should. Rather, the crowd is almost always portrayed as, as this kind of fickle group. That, you know, they, they get caught up, they chase after miracles, but then they oppose his message, or they're ambivalent to it. You know, the, the, and a very common attribute of the crowd, you'll see it comes up regularly in Mark, is that they block or restrict access to Jesus. And this is exactly what's happening in the text here. You know, and so the size of a crowd is not the measure of success in a ministry. Rather, as we look here, those in the crowd, as one commentator puts it, they represent outsiders who stand passively by or oppose Jesus' ministry. This is why Jesus often spoke in parables as well. We'll see that come out in chapter 4 in Mark. And then he would only reveal the true meaning of his teaching to his disciples. His attention was not on the masses. His attention was on the flock, 
those who needed his attention. Jesus was not out there seeking fame and fortune, looking for the biggest audiences possible, like so many celebrity preachers in our day and age do. You know, they're more concerned with becoming a renowned conference speaker than they are caring for their local churches. You know, and those people generally justify their behavior. They, they use platitudes like, well, I get to reach so many people, so I get to have such a big influence. But when we look at Scripture, when we look at what the Bible teaches, we see that the focus is always on the faithful few, not the faithless masses. And we should center our ministries accordingly. A church worship service should care more about what the Bible says they should do than doing what is popular in the world today. This is why we here at Goodwood Baptist, we reject these seeker-sensitive practices you know, that so many other churches adopt. You know, we're not going to play popular music from heretical groups like Bethel or Hillsong. And we're not going to turn our worship service into a performance because it may attract younger people. And we won't water down the preaching of God's Word because it is offensive in, in this modern, more snowflakey kind of era. The church doesn't gather on a Sunday for the sake of the lost. It's true, we will make gospel appeals. There may be unbelievers among us. And so we do want to make appeals to the gospel. But we come together as believers on the Lord's Day to worship God and to edify one another. We, we can read about that in Hebrews 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26 is another place. And if we start pandering to the desires of the masses, then we will start neglecting the needs of those who are truly here to worship. We'll have a building filled with proverbial outsiders, you know, and they would be blocking the needs of the faithful, just like what is happening in the texture. Because in this crowd, there are faithful men, there are men of great faith who are trying to get their paralyzed friend to Jesus. Sorry, I just need some water. They're trying to get their, their friend to Jesus, this paralytic. And, and the text doesn't really tell us what they hoped to achieve by bringing him. But what we do see from the text is that these friends were determined to get him to Jesus. I mean, think about what they've gone through here. These men would have heard that Jesus was home, and then they would have carried this paralytic across town. I don't know if you've ever tried to pick up somebody when they've made their whole body limp. It is very heavy. You know, and they carried this limp person all across town in the Middle Eastern heat. And then when they got there, and they were probably exhausted and covered in sweat, they see this crowd's blocking the way. So then they've got to take him up a flight of stairs all the way to the top of a house. And then they've got to dig through the sun-baked, hardened mud tiles that those houses would have been built with, scratch open the thatch. Then they would have had to tie things to his mat. And then with like the last strength that they probably had, manually lower him down through the roof. 80 kilograms of limp flesh and bones directly lowered down. This was not easy work. And it shows how much they must have loved him. But it also shows how much faith they had in Jesus. You know, they, they went through all of these lengths because they wanted to get him there. And the text tells us that Jesus saw their faith. Their faith was visible to him. He could see what they were doing, their efforts, and he could see that what they were doing was demonstrating the faith and the trust they had in his ability. These men were putting their faith on display through these hard efforts. Now, I want to be very careful here when I talk about this because faith and works should not be confused. We are saved by grace through faith alone, and not of our works. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 will tell us about this. And this is an essential truth of the gospel. This is not something we can compromise on. 
This is, is fundamental. It was a key part of the Reformation. And many preachers today and in history try to muddy the lines between faith and works. They, they try to make our works and efforts a, a kind of, they, they won't say you're saved by your works, but they'll try to smuggle it in and make it a part of our faith and say, well, you have to do these works to have this kind of faith. You know, they speak of faith as though it were faithfulness. And they use it to try and keep Christians accountable. Often when you push back, they'll say, but then we'll have Christians that just won't do the right things. They, they make it a requirement of faith that saves. And I want to be clear about that. This is heresy. It, it, it is false teaching, and it is not something that we can compromise on. And it is a heresy that is as old as time. Ultimately, the, this is what the Roman Catholic Church tried to sneak in with the ideas of penance. But our works have absolutely no bearing on our salvation. None whatsoever. So you don't need to sort yourself out or become a good person before you come to Christ. You, you come as you are. You don't need to sit and think, I need to be a person capable of doing X, Y, and Z before I can become a Christian. No, you come to Jesus. You come as you are, warts, troubles, and all. You come to Him in faith, and He changes you. Jesus is the one who sorts us out. We don't sort ourselves out with Jesus. Because when we're saved, we are saved for good works. This is what Ephesians 2 verses 10 tells us. We are His workmanship. His workmanship. He does the work. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. After a person is saved, good works do come. But the good works come as fruit from their faith. They, they come, they, they aren't a requirement of the faith. They aren't necessary in it. They, they come as fruit. They're an outworking of that faith. And so in a sense, the good works put the faith on display. This is what James meant when he wrote, I will show you my faith by my works. And this is what these men were doing. Their efforts were demonstrating the unwavering faith they had in coming to Jesus. I'm just going to leave this here. They had this unwavering faith. They knew that ultimately what this paralytic needed was to be taken to Jesus. And they went through all of this effort because they really believed it. They trusted in Christ. They may not have known all the nitty-gritty details of what he was going to do, but they knew that this man needed help, and the man that can help, the one that saves is the Redeemer, is Christ, is the one who's here, home, in Capernaum. They trusted that he would not cast them out, he would not chase them away, because Christ will never cast out or turn away those who come to him in repentance and faith. And that he would abundantly provide for their needs. And this is exactly what he did. We'll look at the second point, a demonstration of man's need before God. This is from verse 5b, the second half of verse 5 to 7. See, Jesus sees the faith of these men, and then he tells this young man, he says, son, your sins are forgiven. And, and now this statement immediately raises a number of questions in the crowd. Firstly, we can ask, is Jesus here suggesting that sins and sickness are linked to one another. This is what many faith healers would want us to believe, that if your sins are forgiven, your sicknesses will be healed as well. And, and so it's something that I think we must pay attention to because it is something that is taught in and around us. And so is there a relationship between sin and sickness? And the short answer is yes. You know, all sickness and suffering is a result of man's sin and fall. So, so there's some relationship there. God cursed the earth in Genesis, and sickness has come about as a result of that. But, but secondly, the Bible does also talk about people who are made sick in punishment of their sins. Miriam is a perfect example of this. She was given leprosy for her sins against 
against Moses or against God while she was sinning against Moses. And even in the New Testament, some in the Corinthian church were punished with sickness because they profaned the communion table. But we also need to note that this is not always the case. You know, in the book of Job, Job's friends are rebuked by God for giving him foolish counsel. And that counsel was that he's being afflicted like this because of his besetting sin. And even in John 9 verse 3, Jesus openly denies that that blind man was made blind because of sin. And rather he says that he was made blind so that his power could be on display. You know, and then finally, even if a person does have his sins forgiven, we can see from Scripture that it does not mean he won't suffer sickness. Timothy suffered from a stomach ailment and was told to take medicine for it by Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 5. Paul had a thorn in the flesh that was not removed from him. And so to suggest that people's sins being forgiven will result in physical healing is just plain unbiblical. And in the case of today's text, it is possible. It is possible that this paralytic had some besetting sin that Christ was forgiving and it was causing his condition. But I think from the context, it, it might be telling us to focus on something else here. Because it's more important to note that, as I mentioned before, people are sometimes made sick so that the works of God might be displayed in them. That's what Jesus speaks of in John 9 verse 3. And we'll see in the next point that when Jesus heals this man, he is revealing the works of God in him. And so, so that's probably more likely where his sickness came from. And so rather this text being proof that forgiveness and healing are somehow linked, or what we see here is Jesus telling this man, your sins are forgiven because this is what the man truly needs. Jesus is demonstrating before this crowd who he is and what he came to do. He's demonstrating their need. Their sins need to be forgiven. He's not here to merely heal sick and perform miracles. He's here to forgive sins. If this man's limbs were healed and he was left in sin, his life would be better for a while, but only a couple years, and then he would die, his limbs would wither away, and he would suffer an eternity in hell. But because his sins, or, or the, he would suffer this because he has been alienated from God. You know, it's, all of his suffering is merely a symptom of this greater problem of sin. But if his sins are forgiven, he may suffer in the world for a while, but someday he will receive a resurrected body. He will never suffer sickness again. He will never grow weary, and he will enjoy it for an eternity with God. What he needs is the healing of his heart, not the healing of his limbs. And this is what Jesus is offering him here. And again, as Christians, this is what we should be offering the world. Not a social gospel that promises to eradicate the ills of the world like poverty and other forms of suffering, but never addresses man's sin. We should be offering them the true gospel, the gospel of the forgiveness of their sins, because in this gospel we will ultimately find the healing of the other problems in the world, which is much better. It goes to the heart of the matter. It addresses the root cause. But then another question might get raised from this as well. Okay, so we see this man needs his sins to be forgiven, but who can forgive sins? And this is the issue that, that the scribes have with Jesus in this statement here. It was highly offensive to them, because as far as they are concerned, only God can forgive sins. Not even the chief priest could forgive sins, and they were right in this matter. This is an instance where the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious leaders have good biblical theology. Forgiveness of sins was something that God exclusively claimed to do. You, you can see claims like that in Micah 7 verse 18, Isaiah 43 verse 25, and so on. And in Daniel, we're told that forgiveness belongs to God. Now, this is because 
all sin, no matter what it is, God is ultimately the offended party. We, we can see this most clearly in the instance of David. After he committed adultery with Bathsheba, and then he murdered his friend Uriah, he cries out in the Psalms, and he says, against you and you alone have I sinned. When we sin, we do so against God. And therefore, it is only God who can forgive our sins. So when Jesus comes and he says, son, your sins are forgiven, to this man here, he is making a direct claim to deity. And by saying this, man's sins are forgiven, he's not only demonstrating what man's great need is, he's also revealing who he is. That he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is the God-man, the one who has authority to forgive sins. Jesus has come to save the world from their sins. God incarnate. And he doesn't just come here and say, I'm going to forgive your sins. He also has the power to demonstrate that he possesses this authority. And this is my final point, a demonstration of authority the authority of the Son of Man. You see, the scribes had correct theology. Only God can forgive sins. But their application was a little bit wrong because they thought he was committing blasphemy here. But their application was wrong because they didn't understand that Jesus was God. And Jesus takes issue with them thinking this. Notice again how they don't actually openly object to his claim at this point. They don't even vocalize their complaint. The text says they just thought it in their hearts. And Jesus responds to their thoughts. So he perceives what they're thinking, and then he asks them this rhetorical question. He says, which is more difficult? And it is a bit of a strange question. Sometimes people read it and they wonder what exactly is meant here. And, you know, from it we can see, you know, it is much easier to heal somebody's sicknesses than it is to forgive sins. Because only God can forgive sins. But we've seen people heal sicknesses in, in many other instances. But it is easier for somebody to say your sins are forgiven. Because there's no way to verify this. On the other hand, if you tell somebody, take up your mat and walk, he better walk or you'll be seen to be a fraud. So by asking this question, Jesus is pointing out that, that they're, they're complaining about something that, that they can't verify. They, they, he says your sins are forgiven, and because they can't verify it, they're unhappy about it. And he's reading them for what he's going to do next. Because now when he says he's going to heal the man, he's linking it to his authority to forgive sins. You know, he says that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. He's now showing his authority to forgive sins by healing this man. And, and he gives himself an interesting title here. Uh, it's the first time it comes up in the book of Mark, the Son of Man. But it's going to be used a lot more as the book of Mark progresses. This is a reference to the Son of Man who has the authority of God in the book of Daniel. It's, it's, it's a messianic figure. In Mark, though, the Son of Man title comes up many times, but specifically nine other times it comes up, and a couple of them is chapter 8, 31, 9, 9, 9, 12, 9, 13, and, and there's a couple more, and all of them, he is, gives this title, Son of Man, to himself, with also referencing his coming suffering, that he's going to be the suffering servant as well. And so, the idea of the Son of Man in the book of Mark is that the Son of Man demonstrates his authority primarily through humiliation, suffering, and death. You see, this great authority that forgives sins does so by suffering death on a cross in order to atone for our sins, save his people. And this is who the Son of Man is. And if you don't know him, if, if you're sitting here tonight and you have not put your trust in Christ, now is the time to do it. Put your trust in His authority to forgive your sins. Cry out to the Lord. Pray and ask the Lord to give you the faith 
that you need to come to Him in repentance, the faith that these men had. Because only the God-man can forgive sin. Only He has the authority to do so. Your sins cannot be atoned for in any other way. Only Jesus can do it. Only God can forgive sins. And, and he demonstrates that he has the authority to forgive sins right here in his word through this miracle that we see now. He tells this lame man to walk, and the man gets up and he walks. And, and again, this whole instance is, is replete with Old Testament references. I, I asked Cyril to read Isaiah chapter 35, which you would have seen is, is a is this great promise of God to rescue His people. And we see so many of these promises in the Old Testament. And often you'll see phrases like you saw in verse 6 there. Then shall a lame man leap like a deer. It talks about the blind seeing, the deaf hearing, and the lame walking. And we see Jesus' miracles demonstrating these things again. And so even in them we see this demonstration of God showing that Jesus is the one who's come and is doing these things that will ultimately rescue his people. It's, it's pointing to him being a messianic figure. He's the one who rescues his people. He's the one who forgives their sins. And, and this is the purpose of his miracles. You know, the reason we see so many miracles like this in the text back then is because these miracles validate the message of Jesus and the apostles. He wasn't just some guy who came and said he was the Messiah. He demonstrated that he was the Messiah with miracles. And our takeaway from reading about miracles like this is that it proves that Jesus is the God-man who has the authority to forgive our sins. Our takeaway is not that, oh, look, lame men can walk and be healed. We shouldn't read texts like this and think what we need to do now is go chasing after miracles. Because this misses the entire point. So many people read the New Testament. They see all the miracles and the signs that are performed. And they marvel at the grandeur of them. They, they wow, look at what God has done. But then they think, well, what the church then needs is to chase after miracles like this. You know, if only we could have miracles being worked and the world could see these miracles then they would believe and follow Christ. But this doesn't happen. I mean, Scripture outright denies it. First of all, you know, in the parable of Lazarus, um, there the angel actually says, even if a dead man raises from the dead, they won't believe. But I mean, even look at this crowd, the crowd in Mark again. Here they marvel at the miracle. They marvel at what Jesus did. The text says they even they glorified God for what they saw. But they never repented. In fact, later on, you're going to see the crowds already in Galilee starting to fight with him. And let's not forget that later on, we see another crowd. We see the crowd come again. But this time, the crowd screams, crucify him, and they bay for the blood of Jesus. Because this is what crowds do. This is what the masses do. This is what the world does. They are fickle. He's showing the world's miracles will not convert their hearts. It will just bring crowds along. And they'll ultimately be a hindrance to the ministry of the church. The, the saddest thing about all of this is that by chasing these miracles, many Christians miss the point of the miracle. That these miracles, that these signs attest to who Jesus is. Acts 2 verse 22 clearly states that. And this miracle here points to an even greater miracle. That sinners can have their sins forgiven. That enemies of God can be reconciled to Him. And that through this we can now live with God eternally. He will raise us up one day. He will be our God. We will be His people. We have this blessed, eternal hope. How great a miracle is that? How much better is that than a lame man walking? or a blind man seeing, that God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. This is the greatest miracle that we can experience of all. All other miracles pale in comparison to this. 
And so I would say we should look for these kinds of miracles. We should celebrate these kinds of miracles. We should proclaim the reality of this miracle in our lives to the world. Because in this miracle, they can truly be saved. It can change their hearts. And they can come to the Lord in repentance through the gospel. So let's look at these things. Will you pray with me? Oh, Lord in heaven, as we live um, and struggle in a fallen and broken world, we do rejoice, for you have saved us. And Lord, no matter what we go through, no matter what hardships we face, we can be thankful that our sins are forgiven. And we can sing as we are just about to, that it is well with my soul, through all hardships and struggles. We pray that you would set our hearts and minds on the reality of the gospel ever before us and that we would long for that blessed day when Christ shall return. Amen.